The Bolsheviks come to power. This, or by Alexander Rabinowitch. This is chapter 16, the epilogue. So it's the, the last chapter, finally. About 9 p.m. October 25th, a few hours before the capture of the Winter Palace by the Military Revolutionary Committee, Kransky reached Northern Front headquarters in Pskov, 150, 175 miles southwest of Petrograd. Earlier, the Pskov Soviet had passed a resolution forbidding the dispatch of front detachments to Petrograd to defend the provisional government, as Krylenko soon reported to jubilant deputies at the Second Congress of Soviets. A military revolutionary committee formed by the Pskov Soviet assumed control of local, local communications and transportation facilities and began monitoring the actions of the military high command. General Chermsov, a commander of the Northern Front, recognizing the futility of opposing the troops and the prevailing circumstances and cognizant of the provisional government's hopeless position, now revoked earlier directives authorizing the shipment of, reinforce of reinforcements from the front to Petrograd. He further ordered that troops already en route to the capital be halted. When Kerensky arrived, Chermasov warned that he could not guarantee the Prime Minister's personal safety and urged him to leave Pskov at once. Later that night, Kransky, still in Pskov, met with General Peter Krasnov, the late General Krimov's replacement as commander of the Third Corps, the sizable military force that had been moved toward Petrograd and slated for occupation duty there by General Kornilov in late August. Krasnov, an arc reactionary in politics, disapproved of Chermasov's decision to halt the transfer of front soldiers to Petrograd and was receptive to an attempt to mobilize his own Cossacks for the pacification of the capital. At this time, however, where am I? I lost my place. At this time, however, Third Corps personnel were scattered over hundreds of miles and by and large were no more prone to support the provisional government than were most other troops on the Northern Front. Hence, the force that Krasnov was able to muster on Kerensky's behalf was meager, consisting of 12 and a half 70 man Cossack squadrons, some light artillery, an armored train, and one armored car. On the morning of October 27th, these units occupied Gatchina, where Kerensky established a headquarters. The troops then paused briefly in the vain hope of acquiring reinforcements and began preparations to launch an early assault on the capital. In Petrograd, meanwhile, the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets had approved Lenin's decrees on peace and land. The peace decree promised an end to secret diplomacy and proposed immediate negotiations to secure a democratic peace without annexations and without indemnities. <coughs> The land decree borrowed in its essentials from the popular agrarian program of the left SRs, abolished private property in land and provided for the transfer of all private and church lands to land committees and Soviets of peasants deputies for distribution to the peasantry according to need. <coughs> Prior to dispersing on the early morning of October 27th, the deputies had also elected a new Central Executive Committee to be chaired by Kemenev and consisting of 62 Bolsheviks, 29 left SRs, 6 Menshevik internationalists, and 4 representatives of minor leftist groups. The Congress also endorsed the appointment of a provisional revolutionary government. Members of this new, at first exclusively Bolshevik, administration, formally named the Council Soviet of People's Commissars, <clears throat> were Lenin, Chairman Trotsky for Foreign Affairs, Rikov Internal Affairs, Milutin Agriculture, Shlyapnikov Labor, Nogin Industry and Commerce, Lunikarsky Education, Antonov of Cinco, Krylenko and Dibenko Army and Navy, Lemov for Justice, Ivan, Ivan Skvortsov Finance, <coughs> Uh, sorry. Um, Rykov, oh, 
where am I? Uh, Lu Luna Kursky, <laughs> finance, Ivan Teodorovich, food supply, Nikolai Avalov, Post and Telegraph, and Stalin for nationalities. Among the new commissar's first acts was an announcement that elections to the Constituent Assembly would be held on schedule on November 12th. Initially, fierce resistance to the Bolshevik regime coalesced around the so-called All-Russian Committee for the Salvation of the Country and the Revolution, organized on October 26th, primarily by Mensheviks and SRs in the Petrograd City Duma. This committee included representatives of the City Duma, the Presidium of the Pre-Parliament, the Old Central Executive Committee, the All-Russian Executive Committee of Peasant Soviets, the Menshevik and SR delegations that had left the Second Congress of Soviets, the Railroad and Postal and Telegraph Workers Union, or unions, uh, Centroflot, and the Menshevik and SR Central Committees. <clears throat> In the first days after the Bolsheviks came to power, the Committee for Salvation called on government employees and citizens generally to refrain from recognizing or obeying the Council of People's Commissars, claiming for itself the right to constitute a provisional government. Leaders of the Committee for Salvation also drew up plans to coordinate an uprising in Petrograd <clears throat> with the entry into the capital of Krasnov's Cossacks expected moment momentarily. But their intentions became known to the Military Revolutionary Committee on the night of October 28th before Krasnov was ready to attack. <coughs> Consequently, the Committee for Salvation was forced to initiate open military action against the Bolsheviks the next morning. Cadets from military school in the capital seized the Petrograd telephone station, the Hotel Astoria, and the State Bank. They then prepared to oust the Bolsheviks from Smolny among military personnel in Petrograd. However, only cadets joined the insurrection, and they were no match for the forces quickly mustered by the Military Revolutionary Committee. The points captured early on, October 29th, by the cadets were easily regained. The military schools involved in the insurrection were quickly isolated, blockaded, and in one case bombarded with artillery fire. Before nightfall, all the military schools had capitulated and the premature revolt had been effectively suppressed. Also actively opposed to retention of the exclusively Bolshevik government formed on the night of October 26th to 27th was the moderate socialist-dominated All-Russian Executive Committee of the Union of Railway Workers. Vixel now sought to act as an intermediary between the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Committee for Salvation and to further the creation of a homogeneous socialist government, including representatives of all socialist groups from the People's Socialists on the right to the Bolsheviks on the extreme left. In pursuit of this objective, Vixel called a conference of socialist parties for October 29th, threatening a nationwide rail walkout at midnight on October 29th of its efforts to obtain a ceasefire between the warring sides and to initiate negotiations regarding formation of a broader government were unsuccessful. The threat of a railway strike was ominous. By interrupting communications between Petrograd and the rest of, this, rest of the country, and by withholding food from the capital, Vixel could create an untenable situation for the new government. Partly for this reason, the Bolsheviks agreed to participate in the Vixel-sponsored conference which began on schedule the evening of October 29th. While successful in stimulating high-level political talks, Vixel was unable to bring about a ceasefire. <coughs> the key battle between Krasnov's roughly 1,000-man Cossack force and a motley army approximately 10 times larger, made up of workers, detachments, soldiers of the Petrograd garrison, and Baltic sailors, took place October 30th on the Polkova Heights, north of Sarsko Silo, 12 miles from Petrograd. This struggle, aptly termed the Valmy of the Russian Revolution, was confused, disorganized, and bloody, with both sides sufferings, suffering severe casualties. By late afternoon, 
The offensive of Krasnov's demoralized forces had been halted. The Cossacks, running low on ammunition, were in danger of being outflanked and cut off from the rear. Forced to fall back on Gatchina, the Cossacks agreed two days later to end their resistance and to turn over Kerensky for arrest and public trial on the condition that they be given amnesty and safe conduct home. Forewarned of the Cossacks' capitulation, Kerensky, disguised in a sailor's uniform and automobile goggles, narrowly evaded capture and went into hiding. Under continued pressure from Vixel, whose appeals for compromise and an end to civil war were echoed by the left SRs and Menshevik internationalists, and by such mass organizations in the capital as the Petrograd Trade Union Soviet, the Central Soviet of Factory Shop Committees, and several district Soviets, discussions regarding the formation of a broad socialist government dragged, in, or dragged on for several days. At the start of these talks, representatives of the Menshevik and SR Central Committees had been more concerned with mobilizing military support to defeat the Bolsheviks than with reaching an accommodation with them. As the initial confidence that the Bolsheviks would be overthrown with ease proved unfounded, moderate socialist leaders became somewhat more amenable to serving in a coalition cabinet with the Bolsheviks. They remained adamantly opposed, nonetheless, to participation in a government that included either Lenin or Trotsky. Additionally, the moderate socialists insisted on a variety of safeguards aimed at ensuring that any future government would not be Bolshevik-dominated. Between October 29th and 31st, when it seemed that Krasnov's forces might take the capital, and at a time when the new regime was encountering great difficulty in, in consolidating its authority in Moscow, the Bolshevik leadership appeared ready to make significant concessions on these fundamental issues. During this period, Lenin and Trotsky, preoccupied with pressing logistical and military matters, did not attend either the party meetings at which the Bolsheviks stand on the government issue was formulated, or the session of the Central Executive Committee and the Viscal Conference at which the character and program of a new government were discussed. In their absence, the views of Kamenev, Zinoviev, Rykov, Militin, and other Bolshevik moderates carried particular weight. Kamenev and his associates were firmly convinced that the only hope of defending and preserving the gains of the revolution and of, of achieving an early convocation of the Constituent Assembly and the conclusion of peace lay in the creation of a broad socialist coalition government, which had been their position all along. Hence, they insisted mainly that any new cabinet not include represent representatives of the property class and that it be pledged to pursue the general political and social program endorsed by the Second Congress of Soviets. It is ironic that at the time, the Bolshevik party leadership was inclined toward compromise. The Mensheviks and SRs displayed little interest in coming to terms with the Bolshevik regime. After Krasnov's defeat, when moderate socialists became more amenable to agreement with the Bolsheviks, the Bolshevik Central Committee repudiated the position of its more moderate members and adopted a significantly harder line in the Vixel negotiations. This was in part because the immediate danger to the survival of the new regime in Petrograd had passed, and partly because Lenin and Trotsky now returned to the party's inner councils, where their outlook prevailed. Party representatives were instructed to participate in the Vixel, sorry, Vixel talks solely to expose the impractic impracticability of coalition with moderate socialist groups and to bring the talks quickly to an end. In public institutions such as the Central Executive Committee, Bolshevik moderates continue to press for the formation of a government in which all socialist parties would be represented, even after the moderate position had been voted down in the Central Committee. Indeed, on November 3rd, Kemenev and Zinoviev secured the Central Executive Committee's endorsement of continued efforts to form such a government. For Lenin, who a week and a half earlier had urged that Kemenev and, and Zinoviev be ousted from the party for their public opposition to an insurrection, the moderates' readiness to sabotage the party's work and once again to jeopardize the revolution was maddening. On November 3rd, Lenin drafted an ultimatum which was subsequently signed by nine other members of the Central Committee. Either the opposition would observe party discipline and support the policies agreed upon by a majority, or steps would be taken to expel its members from the party. 
Lenin's ultimatum was presented formally on November 4th, after which Kamenev, Zinoviev, Rykov, Nogin, and Milutin resigned from the Central Committee in protest. Rykov, Nogin, and Milutin, along with Tyodorovich, also withdrew from the government. A few weeks later, the Vixel discussions having foundered, the left SRs agreed to enter the Council of People's Commissars, and several left SRs subsequently accepted government portfolios. Not long after the formation of the Bolshevik left SR coalition government, Kamenev and his associates ended their open opposition to the Bolshevik leadership. <clears throat> In time, all reassumed positions of authority within the party and the government. The participation of the left SRs in the Council of People's Commissars proved to be short-lived. <coughs> in mid-March 1918, they resigned in protest against the signing of the Wunerous Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which ended Russia's involvement in World War I. Ahead, ahead for the Soviet regime lay a two-and-a-half-year civil war against anti-Bolshevik armies, domestic and foreign. This unprece unprecedentedly bitter and devastating life and death struggle was followed by an economic and social crisis, the dimensions of which far exceeded what Russia had gone through in 1917. <clears throat> During these tortured years, the democratic character of the Bolshevik party was lost. The independence of the Soviets was destroyed. An oppressive, centralized bureaucracy was reimposed throughout the country, and Russian political and economic life became harnessed to the dictates of the Bolshevik leadership. These events, however, belong to another chapter in modern Russian history, no less pretentious than the preceding one. The central question of why the Bolsheviks won the struggle for power in Petrograd in 1917 permits no simple answer. To be sure, from the perspective of more than half a century, it is clear that the fundamental weakness of the cadets and moderate socialists during the revolutionary period and the concomitant vitality and influence of the radical left at that time can be traced to the, pe the peculiarities of Russia's political, social, and economic development during the 19th century and earlier. The World War also inevitably had a good deal to do with the way the 1917 revolution in Petrograd turned out. Had it not been for the provisional government's commitment to pursue the war to victory, a policy which in 1917 enjoyed no broad support, it surely would have been better able to cope with the myriad problems that inevitably attended the collapse of the old order, and, in particular, to satisfy popular demands for immediate fundamental reform. As it was, a major source of the Bolsheviks' growing strength and authority in 1917 was the magnetic attraction of the party's platform as embodied in the slogans Peace, Land and Bread, and All Power to the Soviets. The Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks conducted an extraordinarily energetic and resourceful campaign for the support of Petrograd factory workers and soldiers and Kronstadt sailors. Among these groups, the slogan All Power to the Soviets signified the creation of a democratic, exclusively socialist government, representing all parties and groups in the Soviet and committed to a program of immediate peace, meaningful internal reform, and the early convocation of a constituent assembly. In the late spring and summer of 1917, a number of factors served to increase support for the professed goals of the Bolsheviks, especially for transfer of power to the Soviets. Economic conditions steadily worsened. Garrison soldiers became directly threatened by shipment to the front, Popular expectations of early peace and reform under the provisional government dwindled. Concomitantly, all other major political groups lost credibility because of their association with the government and their insistence on patience and sacrifice in the interest of the war effort. In the wake of the Kornilov affair, among the lower strata of the Petrograd population, the desire for an end to coalition government with the cadets became very nearly universal. That in the space of eight months, the Bolsheviks reached a position from which they were able to assume power was due as well to the special effort which the party devoted to winning the support of military troops in the rear and at the front. Only the Bolsheviks seemed to have perceived, perceived the necessarily crucial significance of the armed forces in the struggle for power. 
Perhaps even more fundamentally, the phenomenal Bolshevik success can be attributed in no small measure to the nature of the party in 1917. Here I have in mind neither Lenin's bold and determined leadership, the immense historical significance of which cannot be denied, nor the Bolsheviks' proverbial, though vastly exaggerated, organizational unity and discipline. Rather, I would emphasize the party's internally relatively democratic, tolerant, and decentralized structure and method of operation, as well as its essentially open and mass character, in striking contrast to the traditional Leninist model. As we have seen, sorry about that, as we have seen within the Bolshevik Petrograd organization at all levels in 1917, there was continuing free and lively discussion and debate over the most basic theoretical and tactical issues. Leaders who differed with the majority were at liberty to fight for their views and not infrequently, Lenin was the loser in these struggles. <clears throat> to gauge the importance of this tolerance of differences of opinion and ongoing give and take, it is enough to recall that throughout 1917, many of the Bolsheviks' most important resolutions and public statements were influenced as much by the outlook of right Bolsheviks as by that of Lenin. In addition, moderate Bolsheviks like Klemenev, Zinoviev, Lunikarsky, and Ryazanov were among the party's most articulate and respected spokesmen in key public institutions such as the Soviets and the trade unions. In 1917, subordinate party bodies like the Petersburg Committee and the military organization were permitted considerable independence and initiative, and their views and criticism were taken into account in the formation of policy at the highest levels. Most important, these lower bodies were able to tailor the tactics and appeals to suit their own particular constituencies amid rapidly changing conditions. Vast numbers of new members were recruited into the party, and they too played a significant role in shaping the Bolsheviks' behavior. Among these newcomers were many of the leading figures in the October Revolution, among them Trotsky, Antonov, Avsinko, Lunikarsky, and Chudnovsky. The newcomers included tens of thousands of workers and soldiers from among the most impatient and dissatisfied elements in the factories and garrison who knew little, if anything, about Marxism and cared nothing about party discipline. This caused extreme difficulties in July when leaders of the military organization and the Petersburg Committee, responsive to their militant constituencies, encouraged an insurrection against the wishes of the Central Committee. But during the period of reaction that followed the July uprising in the course of the fight against Kornilov, and again during the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks' extensive, carefully cultivated connections in factories Local workers' organizations and units of the Petrograd garrison and the Baltic fleet were to be a significant source of the party's durability and strength. The importance to the Bolshevik success of the dynamic relationship that existed in 1917 within the top Bolshevik hierarchy, as well as between it, the ostensibly subordinate elements of the party and the masses, was illustrated immediately after the July uprising. At the time, Lenin believed that the provisional government was effectively controlled by counter-revolutionary elements. Overestimating the government's capacity to damage the left, he was convinced, moreover, that under the influence of the Mensheviks and SRs, the existing Soviets had been rendered powerless. <clears throat> hence, the demand, hence, he demanded that the party abandon its orientation toward a possible peaceful transfer of power to the Soviets and shift its attention toward preparations for an armed uprising at the earliest opportunity. Other leaders, many of whom had particularly close ties with workers and soldiers and were also active in the Central Executive Committee and the Petrograd Soviet, refused to discount completely the Mensheviks and SRs as potential allies and the Soviets as legitimate revolutionary institutions. While the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, was officially withdrawn by the 6th Congress in late July, this change did not take hold at the local level. Moreover, the Congress did not de-emphasize efforts to win the Soviets, and they continued to be a major focus of party activity throughout the month of August. As it turned out, the impact of the post-July days reaction against the left was not nearly as serious as originally feared. 
To the contrary, the repressive measures adopted by the government, as well as the indiscriminate persecution of leftist leaders and the apparently increasing danger of counter-revolution, served simply to increase resentment towards the Kerensky regime among the masses and stimulated them to unite more closely around the Soviets in defense of the revolution. The Bolsheviks, working in cooperation with Mensheviks and SRs, primarily through revolutionary committees created by the Soviets, played a leading role in the quick defeat of Kornilov. Of Kornilov. In the capital, the Petrograd Soviet, distinctly more radical in composition and outlook, emerged from the Kornilov experience with its power and authority greatly enhanced. In response, the Bolsheviks in early September formally resurrected their main pre-July slogan, all power to the Soviets. Probably the clearest example of the importance and value of the party's relatively free and flexible structure and the responsiveness of its tactics to the prevailing mass mood came during the second half of September, when party leaders in Petrograd turned a deaf ear to the ill-timed appeals of Lenin, then still in hiding in Finland for an immediate insurrection. To be sure, on October 10th, the Bolshevik Central Committee, with Lenin in attendance, made the organization of an armed insurrection and the seizure of power the order of the day. Yet in the ensuing days, there was mounting evidence that an uprising launched independently of the Soviets and in advance of the Second Congress of Soviets would not be supported by the Petrograd masses. That the seizure of power by the Bolsheviks alone would be opposed by all the other major political parties, by peasants in the provinces and soldiers at the front, and possibly even by such mass democratic institutions as the Soviets and trade unions, and that in any case the party was technically unprepared for an offensive against the government. In these circumstances, tactically cautious party leaders in Petrograd, headed by Trotsky, devised the strategy of employing the organs of the Petrograd Soviet for the seizure of power, of masking an attack on the government as a defensive operation on behalf of the Soviet, and, if possible, of linking the formal overthrow of the government with the work of the Second Congress of Soviets. On October 21st to 23rd, using an excuse the governments announced in, in the government's announced intention of transferring the bulk of the garrison to the front and cloaking every move as a defensive measure against the counter-revolution, the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet took control of most Petrograd-based military units, in effect disarming the provisional government without a shot. In response, early on the morning of October 24th, Kerensky initiated steps to suppress the left. Only at this point, just hours before the scheduled opening of the Congress of Soviets, and in part under continuous prodding by Lenin, did the armed uprising that Lenin had been advocating for well over a month actually begin. The argument has been made that the belated uprising of October 24th to 25th was of crucial historical importance because by impelling the main body of Mensheviks and SRs to withdraw from the Second Congress of Soviets, it prevented the creation by the Congress of a Socialist Coalition Government, in which the moderate socialists might have had a strong voice. In so doing, it paved the way for the formation of a Soviet government completely controlled and dominated by the Bolsheviks. The evidence indicates that this was indeed the case. A more crucial point, however, is that only in the wake of the government's direct attack on the left was an armed uprising of the kind envisioned by Lenin feasible for bears repeating that the Petrograd masses, to the extent that they supported the Bolsheviks in the overthrow of the provisional government, did so not out of any sympathy for strictly Bolshevik rule, but because they believed the revolution and the Congress to be in imminent danger. Only the creation of a broadly representative, exclusively socialist government by the Congress of Soviets, which is what they believed the Bolsheviks stood for, appeared to offer the hope of ensuring that there would be there would not be a return to the hated ways of the old regime, of avoiding death at the front and achieving a better life, and of putting a quick end to Russia's participation in the war.